Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 83, and it is a very special episode uh, featuring what I consider to be the story of the 2018 World Series of Poker. Uh, Do you remember the 2018 WSOP? We're talking about a series that saw Joe Cotta win two bracelets and go deep in the main event. Sean Deeb won two bracelets as well, and ran away with the Player of the Year award. Uh, Justin Bonomo won 10 million in the big one for one drop. And don't forget that 2018 is also the summer where Phil Helmuth won his record furthering 15th bracelet. And yet, despite all those major stories, it was the winner of the $1,500 stud event, Steve Albini, who transcended the poker world to grab mainstream attention. The uh, $105,000 first place prize was one of the smaller payouts of the summer, but it was Albini's win that was being written up in headlines by outlets like Rolling Stone and Pitchfork, and it even inspired a mini documentary on Poker Go. Steve is, uh, of course, not famous for being a professional poker player, although he does count on the game for a portion of his income. Instead, Steve is most well known as a musician and producer, even though he prefers the term recording engineer. Steve started his music career in 1981 with the band Big Black before forming Shellac in 1992, a group he still tours with nearly 30 years later. When he's not making his own music, he's recording others at his own studio, Electrical Audio in Chicago. Steve has worked on thousands of albums during his career, most notably with acts such as Nirvana, Bush, The Pixies, The Breeders, Chevelle, PJ Harvey, Joanna Newsom, Jawbreaker, the list goes on and on and on. I'm sure there are plenty of Albini fans who have found this podcast looking for some music stories. Well, I can say confidently that you won't be disappointed. But there is also plenty of poker talk as well for my loyal Poker Stories listeners. Anyway, that's enough intro. Here's my conversation with Steve Albini. I am here with uh, the legendary Steve Albini. Steve, how you doing? I'm great. Yes. Uh, You know, all things As you wipe your eyes. (laughs) You're not jet lagged, are you? No, I just suffered yesterday Mm -hmm. in the cash game and I... Yeah, let's tell our audience um, why you are here in Vegas. I'm in Vegas because the Poker Go streaming mm-hmm. service um, put together a relatable stakes cash mm-hmm. game. Like normally, their cash games are you know these. Everyone in that game told me that they were like, "Oh yeah, we're slumming it at fifty a hundred tonight." That's a big game for it's a big game for me of the world. <laughs> yeah, it's a big game for me. It's the biggest like the biggest game that I regularly play mm-hmm. is that big, but. Um, the the cash games that they've had on there in the past have been in the thousands. You know, like they yes. add a zero on it. At a right. Minimum. You're referring to you know uh, this per- uh, particular edition of the show was Dolly's game. Yeah. Which is a mixed game format, usually horse uh, and Doyle plays in it. This time Todd played in it, and yeah. then uh, Jennifer Harmon and some of your buddies. Yeah, I think the the way the genesis of it was that. Um, Brandon Shaq Harris, who's a good friend of mine who I yeah. met in Chicago. But I haven't now, seen him in a while. He now lives in Vegas. <laughs> um, I should tell our listeners he is in the room. <laughs> He's listening you know. here to correct any lies you might tell. All so right. Fair enough. <laughs> um, anyway, he tweeted uh, an idea that he had about um, – there's always uh, – people that play mixed games regularly are typically in a small player pool in a given – city or at, at you know like there's a game that goes every Tuesday and the Tuesday players are all always the same guys or there's mm-hmm. a game that goes at this one spot on Friday and every Friday it's always the same guys there so there's always some politicking 
uh, or some jostling for like getting your favorite games in the mix Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, getting the number of games or the size of the game in your sweet spot, right? Exactly. So Brandon proposed a format for mixed game where, um, it you know, you invite a bunch of people, and if you arrived in costume, you got to pick a couple of games in the mix. <laughs> but if you didn't, you could play, but you didn't get to pick any games. Yeah, got to wear the costume. Yeah. So uh, then Norman Chad said, "This is a great idea. Let's have this uh, masquerade." Uh, mix game at my uh, and we'll do it as a home game at my place and then he listed a bunch of players that he'd like to have come to his home game and those players all basically said this is a great idea i'm in let's do it and then zach ralston from poker go who's one of the producers there he saw that tweet and he said hey we should do a game like this on poker go and stream it and um norman chad wanted to do a like a a a, a game where nobody was going to get butchered because it was meant to be lighthearted and Mm -hmm. a good-natured thing. So he was saying, okay, let's do like a mid-stakes game and, you know, we'll still have all all these people that I like come and play. Yeah. And being fair, like Norman Chad's image, his public image, is that he's a real grouch and a grump. Right, my ex-wife, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, (laughs) but uh, he's an extremely warm and funny guy. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, and he's very fun to be around. He's a great conversationalist and, you know, he knows a lot about, you know, sports and poker in particular. And he's, uh, if you're going to pick somebody to host a game, which is a group of interesting characters, he's literally the perfect guy, you know. Um, So they did a... They set up a game, and the structure of the game was 1500 horse, which is kind of an uh, archaic format these days. Um, <laughs> yeah, where's the Badesi, right? Yeah. But, uh, and then they, as a sort of a gimmick, the regular announcers for Poker Go, Norman Chad, Ali Jad, and uh, David Tuckman, um, would rotate into the game. They were all playing on one mm-hmm. chip stack, but they would rotate <laughs> into the game after every break. Uh, and so there was a kind of a there was a there was a little bit of competition among them to see who could do yeah, best. And wasn't going to ruin it for the rest of the team. And then there, <laughs> then that sort of inverted, and it became a kind of a needle. Like, oh, this is the money my cohort have won. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can dust that off. You know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So yeah, it was a very entertaining game, and uh, I did okay the first day. The second day, I just got ruined. But mm. uh, that that's equal measures. Running bad and playing bad. As I, I've been reviewing the stream, and I, I, while it was underway, it just felt like I was just getting shelled, you know, just like <laughs> nonstop, just you know, just getting shitholed every hand. Like, yeah. did you uh, did you go to bed thinking of a particular hand last night? There's one hand that I think uh, I will take to my grave with me, <laughs> and that was um, my good friend Brandon Shack Harris uh, put in five bets bad in a Raz hand, which is really. Mm-hmm rare Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to understand like brandon and i have played each other a lot we know each other well Mm -hmm. he knows that game better than anybody on earth and it's super super rare for him to make a a a bet a a mistake for multiple bets by misreading a situation not disagreeing with super rare for him to do that (laughs) so like uh, and i i felt like this is like a you know a, a lunar eclipse frequency event that Brandon is shitting the bed on this in this hand I have to take advantage of it you know <laughs> like course, he's yeah. not going to make a mistake against me in a Raz hand very often <laughs> so let's put all the money in you know mm. I was actually slightly irritated once the f- the fifth bet went in, went in and the dealer said that's a cap it's not a cap and I'm a little irritated that the dealer said that's a cap because I'm not sure if Brandon would have put in a six bet. He no says chance. he wouldn't. There's He's no chance. <laughs> not with his hand. Okay, he says no. <laughs> I was pretty pretty happy putting in the fourth one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it is it is like the worst thing on earth when you have a session where you, you get the raise in and then you get punished for it. Like yeah, why would there be the a raisin. why would there be a cap heads up? Well, that's the thing. Five bets is is a bet it, and four raises, yeah. That's a cap in a multi-way pot. Mm-hmm. But so she was just counting five bets and instead of saying that's five bets, she said that's a cap. Ah. Uh, it didn't I I trust Brandon that yeah. it didn't make any any difference, but it, if at that moment he'd said I declare all in, I would have called, of course, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So at any rate, uh, so 
that that hand that that was like the second hand or third hand dealt of of the of the whole game. Oh wow! And that <laughs> set the tone. Like every like from then on for the rest of that first session, uh, I would either have a big hand and get it outrun, or I would make a, a hand with a, a big draw and not get there. Mm-hmm. And um, most of the decisions weren't difficult. I, you know, I, there, there's one spot where I really mis, misjudged a hand, really misplayed a hand, and lost a lot of bets. But um, for the most part, it was just situations not working out. Yeah. Well, hopefully your return visit is better <laughs> uh, next time you're in town for either cash games or the World Series of Poker, which we'll get to. Uh, I want to start at the beginning. Hmm. Um, let's go to Missoula, Montana. Yeah. Tell the, me about that. Well, actually, Pasadena. But <laughs> well, I was born. I was born in, in California. My my dad worked as a um, – his degrees are in aerodynamics mm-hmm. and mathematics, and it, and that's what – Well, I read fire scientist, which yeah. sounds way cooler. <laughs> uh, that's – later in life, he applied all of that computer modeling and physics and math to the project of uh, computer modeling of forest fires, but mm. that, that was much later in life. He worked in aerodynamics. He was basically a rocket scientist yeah. and – uh, so he was working for defense contractors in California, and uh, then we moved to Washington, D.C., and he worked for uh, defense contractors in Washington, D.C., and then we moved back to California for a bit to work for another <laughs> aerospace company or another um, a- another aer- aeronautical engineering company, and then moved back to D.C., and then um, this job opened up where he could be one of a, a very small number of people working in a laboratory working on the the science of forest fires, and he became one of the preeminent people in the world in that discipline. Like, it was part of the Interior Department. It was called the Northern Forest Fire Research Laboratory. It was in Missoula, Montana, and... Um, he was a big outdoorsman. He loved hunting and fishing yeah. and that sort of stuff. And that's and he just it just seemed like the perfect job for him. Very very hard problems. He he my dad loved the hardest possible problem. Like whatever the the toughest nut to crack was, that's what he wanted to work yeah. on. And forest fires are just insanely complicated because there's um, huge temperature differentials. In, like it can be anything from a small brush fire to like a raging thing the size of a city. You know, it can be, you know, there are fires so big that they make their own weather, that sort of thing. Yeah. And for for a guy to, to like, a, approach a problem like that of trying to figure out what was happening and predict its behavior is just an incredibly daunting thing. And they were able to, to develop some tools that are still being used and still being improved to, um, like, predict the behavior of forest fires, basically. Well, how does a California kid like you adjust to life in Missoula, Montana? Uh I was still, you know, we moved so much when I was young that I yeah. didn't really have a sense of place when mm-hmm. I was a kid until we got to Montana. And I did most of my, you know, I did all my adolescence and my principal growing up in Montana. And that kind of defined my mm-hmm. worldview. Um, then as a teenager, I started to get into music and um, I started to feel slightly confined by um, there's a sort of there's a small town attitude that is universal, which is where people are conservative, not just politically conservative, but they're conservative in their thinking and their behavior. And they're not risk takers and they don't necessarily want to expand their worldview beyond the hundred people that they've known their whole lives, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and I started to feel kind of constrained by that. And I left to go to Chicago to go to college. I went to Northwestern University. Mm-hmm. Now, at the time, you're not thinking career in music. I know you're playing the bass at this point, yeah. right? But you're not thinking career in music. You're thinking... No, no, absolutely not. Okay. I, I studied journalism. I have a degree in journalism. I wanted to be a journalist. Mm-hmm. And then through you the... kind of worked as one, right? Well, I've, I've written for written for fanzines and music magazines and stuff like that and some technical journals, but... Not, I, not, did, uh, I did read a, a piece by you that's quite famous uh, uh, last night, obviously, the... What's it called? The problem. The problem with music. <laughs> the problem with music. So there was a there was a politics and culture magazine uh, out of there was a politics and culture uh, magazine out of Chicago uh, called the Baffler, and it, it in its circles it was fairly influential. And they asked me to write something uh, about music, and I wanted to write something about the power structures that existed in music and the way 
the musicians, the most important people in the system, were the people given least consideration yeah. by the industry structure and by the by the the sort of the the conventional thinking in the music business yeah. regarded the interests of the musicians as the lowest priority. And I wanted to basically I wanted to write that as a warning to my fellow musician friends, my peers, that if you get involved in this corporate enterprise, um, it will likely end your career and you know that the whole thing exists not for your benefit but for its own benefit mm -hmm. so it was kind of a, a a warning to my peers in the music scene about what could happen if you end up getting involved in a big corporate record uh, contract and there are a lot of things that people just don't consider like the entanglement is basically endless like you you it's very difficult to get released from a contract even if the if the record label doesn't want you to do anything like they don't want to pay you they don't want you to make any more records right um, it's very difficult for them to 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 get them to say well okay now you can but you could do it for somebody else like they just they'd much prefer that your band just broke up and disappeared you know mm -hmm. and that's a that's a risk that a lot of bands just didn't realize was even there yeah um a lot has changed in the music business since I wrote that article. That was in the early 90s. Um, a lot has changed. The, the fundamental aspect of it, that the music, business, the music business exists for its own benefit and not for the benefit of the people making music, mm -hmm. that hasn't changed. But the mechanisms that are used to distribute music, the power players in the music scene, and the, the norms of behavior and contracts and stuff, those have all changed quite a bit. So the, the article is is relevant now mainly as yeah. a historical artifact to see how musicians used to get screwed. Well, I was going to say it, it's amazing how much has changed and yet still not changed, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, 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 like the general perspective that there is an, uh, a music industry which is above and, and uh, overarching the relationship between the, the musicians and their audience mm -hmm. – that's still true, but it's much less influential, much less powerful yeah. thing now, because the 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 consumption of music is now not as as tightly controlled. It used to be a very small number of radio programmers and uh, MTV programmers sort of dictated what everyone would be allowed to hear, and it uh, in the in broadcaster uh, as videos, right? And it used to be that a very small number of record companies dictated what records would be made and it, what stores they would appear in and what markets would be served with what kinds of music and all that sort of stuff. None of that is true anymore. The internet yeah. changed all of that. Now I could be published tomorrow on SoundCloud. Yeah, absolutely. Like you could it go home tonight. terrible. You could go home tonight <laughs> and record something on your iPhone mm -hmm. and put it up on YouTube and you could be known worldwide tomorrow. Yeah. Like that's – and that is such an amazing Wasn't that Old Town Road? Wasn't that the story <laughs> exactly. behind Old yeah. Town Road? I mean there are a lot of people that – where that – a lot of – I mean a lot of careers have started that way with yeah. just really casual stuff that just sort of caught fire. Well, let's talk about your career a little bit. I'm not a rock journalist mm -hmm. as much as I'd love to be and I don't want to sit here and – make you rehash stories about Kurt Cobain. But I do want to talk about, uh, y you know, a few things. Sure. You as a performer versus your job as a recording engineer. Mm -hmm. Even I know you don't like the label producer. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you consider yourself first and foremost? I know you got to throw a poker player in there at some point as well. Well, <laughs> um, my my day-to-day -day job is that I, I work as an engineer mm -hmm. at a recording studio that I also happen to own. Yeah. So I own the recording studio. I'm the president of the corporation that owns the business. Yes, this is the famous studio in Chicago. Electrical Audio is the name of the studio. It was featured in the documentary uh, Sonic Highways, which yeah. I've seen three times that episode. <laughs> it's I, I could tell the story of how I first became aware of you as a person. I first heard your name from Brandon, believe it or not. Brandon was crushing in 2014 at the series, and he was telling me his story in an interview in the back hallway, and your name came up, and he's like, man, he keeps saying that name. I really should know what that name is. <laughs> <laughs> and then like a year later, of course, uh, uh, the Dave Grohl's um, The Foo Fighters documentary comes mm -hmm. out, and you're like the main character of that first episode. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that. Maybe Buddy. Yeah, died. I mean, the the <laughs> the notion of that series was that he was going to mm -hmm. go to places that had that resonated with him for one reason or another, either places that where the cities that meant a lot to him, or where he had personal contacts yeah. of people that meant a lot to him, and he wanted to do a very deep dive into those cities and why those cities and their music scene and everything was important to them, to him. 
And I thought he did an amazing job doing portraits of those scenes, in particular the Chicago one and the Washington, D.C. one. Oh, with the go-go music. Uh, I mean, go-go music is <laughs> that like, was fun. criminally underdocumented. Mm-hmm. And, that, and the era of go-go music spans a pretty long period, but it was really only... It, you know, it very, very briefly popped into popular culture and like little snippets of it made their way into pop music. But um, but Go-Go was just like an an, an evergreen scene in D.C. And uh, I I was just fascinated by that. I, was, I really, you know, that that I've always been I, I saw the band Trouble Funk in the early 80s uh, and that seeing them live was such a, an amazing experience. Like you hear an entire room full of people bouncing in rhythm to a live band as opposed to just like a track and a light show, yeah. you know. It was a really, really special experience, and I thought he captured that really well. I love that episode. I do think the Chicago episode was the best. I thought that that song, Something From Nothing, was the best of that album. Uh, and that you were like a mini star of that episode. <laughs> it was funny. I mean, they, he called you brilliant but cynical, a, a cynical mm-hmm. prick, which I'm like, oh, I mean, that, that, that's kind of cool and stuff like <laughs> Story that. checks out. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, if you had your choice in life, would you rather yeah. just be on tour all the time and not do the recording thing? I mean, I'm trying to get a sense. Of, are you Leo Fender with the skills on guitar or are you more the less Paul-minded? Uh, well... I think the reason that I haven't gone batshit is that I have these very clearly delineated areas of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a creative outlet. I can I'm in a band and we can put out records and write songs and tour and that is enormously rewarding for me. But I don't have to do it every day. Yeah. I you know, the, the way my life is structured that I do that stuff in the margins of the rest of my life. Like when there's time for me to work on music, I get to play in the band and we can tour. We do about six weeks of touring a year, something like that, which is not a grueling schedule, but it's enough yeah. for us to keep our sea legs and enough for us to, you know, like, you know, we can play all the places that want to see us in that particular year, that kind of <laughs> thing. Uh, and then every few years we have enough material to put out a record and we put out a record and we've been dealing with the same record label forever for 25 years yeah. so there's never any drama about you're talking about your band Shellac same roster for the whole ride yeah. right yeah uh, and I think Part of the reason that the band has been so consistent in it, like we've all got the same degree, same relationship with it, is that it's not an obligation for us. It's a, it's a joy. It's a, yeah. it's an, ex, it's an escape, right? Um, and I think if if I had tried to make music, performing music, my entire life, I if I had tried to be a professional musician and do that all day every day. I think it would have eventually become a job and a chore, and I would have resented it. Right. And I'm thrilled that because of the place of music in my life, I have never come to resent my band. It is a pure joy for Mm -hmm. me. Right. And I'm wondering if being in the band also helps you out with your day job of recording all these other acts because you get that creative fulfillment. You don't feel the need to push it onto other projects. Absolutely. Which that's, is what your style is known for, right? That's a very astute observation. Like most people who write about music exclusively mm-hmm. assume that someone in my position who's responsible for making other people's records, that what I want to do is that I want to collaborate with people and I want to shape their vision mm-hmm. to suit me. I don't want to do that. I have a creative outlet where I can do that in my own band. Yeah. I can make those records however we want them to be, right? Yeah. I don't need to make you suffer that for your record, <laughs> you know. Yeah, your job there is just capture the sound and yeah, yeah, to like you have an idea about what you want your record to be like. Mm-hmm. My job as an engineer, as a technician, is to make your idea a, a tangible reality. Mm-hmm. Like if you have an a, an image in your head of what your music is supposed to sound like, my job is to get you that image and make it audible even if you think it sucks <laughs> yeah I, I i think that's yeah that's off the table like i don't i don't evaluate my if i'm working with a band mm-hmm. i think it would be rude for me to form an opinion about whether i like them or not i think that's just 
it's it would be like if you go to the dentist and your dentist like spent a lot of his time evaluating whether he thought whether or not he thought you were attractive you know it's just <laughs> it's just rude you know yeah he's there to fix teeth exactly <laughs> uh, and well, are you capable of listening to music like the rest the way the rest of us do uh, or are you just hearing good or bad audio <laughs> i i have not there's an odd trait that i have <laughs> which is that when i'm working on a particular project when I'm thinking, or like, let's say I'm working on a record in the studio, mm-hmm. I'm thinking almost exclusively in technical terms. I'm thinking almost exclusively in practical terms, like, do we have enough days booked to finish this record? What's the next task we need to do? Is that tape machine misbehaving? Why can't I hear that hi hat? Exactly. Yeah. Like, there are all there are these cat. There are these problems that need to be solved and mm-hmm. and issues that need to be addressed and planning that needs to be done. Right. So that is a, a very specific kind of thinking. And when I'm working on that project, I'm thinking exclusively in that way. Right. Then when I move to some other venue of my life, like it, when my band is playing uh, or we're writing songs or we're recording, I'm not thinking that way at all. I'm now I'm thinking in a in a sort of a normal collaborative creative mode with my bandmates and we're discussing options and trying to solve the riddle of our yeah. music, trying to make music that's engaging to us. So you're not hearing you're not listening for the technical stuff anymore. And then when I go home at night and I'm not working and I don't have a project on my minds on my mind and my wife puts on a Bill Withers record or something like that, then I can enjoy that like just purely mm-hmm. for as as enjoyment, and you, you have know? to listen to that at night because <laughs> there there ain't no sunshine. That is the best. That is the best time. Uh, I want to talk about one album only. I'm not okay. going to bug you about In Utero. I know everyone wants it. I was obsessed with Razorblade Suitcase as a you're mid- the guy. You're the one that uh, I was a huge Bush fan. Uh-huh. I was that kid for sure. Um, I was wondering if if you have a story about that recording that one. Well, um, the they were a really odd band in a number of ways. <laughs> they were a British band yeah. that played kind of hard rock, uh, grungy type music during an era when all of the British bands were very foppish and fey and trendy. You know, okay. like the all the Brit pop music mm-hmm. had all of these like the, sort the Gallagher of Gallagher Brothers and <laughs> had all this like clever aspects to it and you know it was all like you know all this ironic references to country life and british you know you know archaic british norms and stuff like that like it was very <laughs> arch and very you know had a very very highly stylized music and they were making music that was more in the tradition of the music descended from punk rock and the music descended from you know rock bands playing in bars right yeah completely out of character with an english audience english audience did not resonate with it at all so they came to america and started touring relentlessly in america and they you know for a couple of years straight they literally they literally played every fat spot in a road you know like (laughs) any town that had a club they would play that club and then they would book it again for the next next trip through yeah that was for the 16 stone album yeah and you know, and every town that had a radio station, they would show up at that radio station and do an interview. And every magazine that had a writer, they would go and talk to that writer. Like they put in an incredible amount of legwork in the U.S. <laughs> in the U.S. and became a sensation in the U.S. Like over time, it didn't happen instantly. It took about a year, year and a half before mm-hmm. their record became a successful record, and then it became a very successful record. They had a very high profile <coughs> in America, and. So they had this weird s- sort of split. Yeah. Like they could go home to England, you know, and see all the people that they would see in normal day-to-day interaction who would have no idea that they were <laughs> famous rock stars, right? And yeah. all, you know, and there were a lot of articles in the British press about like, you know, how this this surprising success in America of this band Bush that no you know they're unknown in the, at home you know like literally that was the the That's tagline I had was no that idea. they were unknown at home but they were big in America and the the thing that was incredible about it was that all of those Britpop bands and all the all the British rock bands of the day that were all you know working the press in the UK really hard and you know 
being very being quite networky in the UK music scene, all of them would have happily severed an arm to make it big in America. You know, of course, that's like the one thing that they wanted to do, and they had no shot. Around the same time, the band Oasis tried to crack America. Mm-hmm. Like they mounted a tour of America, and no one was showing up at any of the venues. So they kept downsizing the venues and giving away free tickets. And still, nobody came. Like, nobody cared. And so there were articles being written about how this this band, this unknown band, Bush, were, you know, as big as Oasis in America. That's <laughs> crazy. Know? Which was, the comedy was that Oasis were, like, on a par with Bush's road crew in America, you know? <laughs> like, uh, so th- that's the sort of... The, the weird circumstances of that band is that they became famous in America. They were English, but they became famous in America, and they got very little respect uh, from the English music scene. Then there was a kind of a bad rap against them in America because their music was obviously influenced by other contemporaries of theirs, like Nirvana. Mm-hmm. And that was... I mean, while true, I think it's uh, kind of a cheap shot because, like, literally every band is influenced of by course. the bands that they like. Yeah. Like, when I started making music, like, the music that I made, it, it sounded very much like the bands I liked, you know? You, you were all about the Ramones. Yeah, among others. But, you know, like... Naked Reagan. Yeah, and I could find... You could easily find parts of songs that I've written and say, oh, yeah, well, that's lifted from this, for sure. Mm-hmm. And that's true. I think that's true of any musician, and I think it's kind of a cheap shot, but... Whatever. Um, so there's a, there's a podcast I listen to that's always talking about that. It's called uh, "Who Cares About the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame," mm. and they basically mention the fact Elvis himself. I mean, took oh yeah, absolutely every song he <laughs> that made him famous from black artists before him. So yeah. what even is the genre you're working in? Well, I I think what makes something remarkable is that when you hear it, you there's a spark of recognition and it resonates with you in a way that seems unique and it seems new and genuine Mm -hmm. right and i think that's true of anything any music that you perceive any music that that affects you has something about it that seems genuine and something about it that's new and surprising and engaging right and even in genre music like music where from one artist to the next the differences are very small if you are embedded in that genre in that idiom if you if that's all if that's your whole world of music those little differences are going to mean an enormous amount i mean that's true in all kinds of like electronic and techno music it's true in heavy metal music it's course, true in yeah. punk music like the difference between this kind of heavy metal and that kind of heavy metal can be a shooting war as far as they're concerned but of course for yeah, us yeah. on the outside of it it's like a trivial it's difference it's all the same <laughs> you know. uh yeah so you're getting back to the uh the bush uh, anyway, so they were a band that had achieved an enormous amount of success, mm-hmm. but had not been garnered a lot of respect, either by the music intelligentsia in America or by their native music scene at home. And I, I just got along with them as people, and I, and I think that they were genuine about everything. Like the the music that they made was genuinely the music that they wanted to make. Like, and I. I became friends with Gavin Rossdale, the singer, and um, I saw him recently at one of those package tours where they have, like, bands from the 90s mm-hmm. out on stage, you know, a bunch of bands from the 90s playing one night, and, <laughs> and Bush were headlining one of these package tours, and he invited my wife and I down to the show, and he was very gracious, and and, and the show was, for that caliber of music, head and shoulders above all of the other peers that they were yeah. that they were playing with, they right? They still had out. And it, the and they played some new material, like material from the last year or two, and it was perfectly in keeping with the music that they was that he was making twenty five years ago. Like that's just what this guy wants to do, you know. That's the kind of music he likes. That's the, that's what he wants to do. I stuck with them after after um, Razor Blade Suitcase. I was there for the Chemicals Between Us and mm-hmm. in Beyond. Um, uh, I wanted to to ask you. You toured all over the world with your band. Do you have mm-hmm. a favorite destination or venue? For the last 15 or 16 years, we have played um, a couple of festivals in Barcelona and Porto, Portugal, the Primavera Sound Festivals. Mm-hmm. And they have gotten really, really big, like really out of hand big, like hundreds of thousands of people. Mm-hmm. But we've been playing at that festival and since it was fairly small. Um, I just very, very much like their attitude about music. It's extremely eclectic. It's curated 
meaning that the stages might have like each stage might have a, a, a sort of a, a a cultural or aesthetic thrust but the bands playing on each of those stages will be satisfying uh, indi- individually like it's they they've chosen a slate of music that is going to satisfy people who are specifically into that kind of music it's not um, it's not just like a scattershot, a little bit of everything kind of festival. It's mm-hmm. very, very much the best of the best as far as their curators are concerned. Yeah. And I, I just admire and respect them and the, the way that they operate the festival, I think, is very humane. The way the, 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 way the patrons are treated, the way the musicians are treated, it's, it's just a very well-run festival. And it's an outgrowth of a movement that was started by um, – there was a – the music festivals in the 70s and the 80s were brutal affairs. There were a few headliners that were paid an enormous amount of money, and the festivals would compete to get the same head- headliners, and so yeah. the headliners were very consistent between across the festivals. And then all of the other spots were kind of a mishmash of whatever garbage the record labels were trying to promote, and then the bottom tier of artists were people who had literally bought spots through payola. <laughs> and so you, you would have these lineups where there would be like a headline act that you would know and would be familiar. And then a bunch of people who were kind of the hype machines of the moment. And then a bunch of people who were just filler, ambitious filler, yeah. you know, just, you know, grasping aspirant people who were, who were a management company. The or, small print in the poster. Yeah, or a record label was like willing to spend a bunch of money to get them mm-hmm. on the festival, right? The patrons were exploited brutally. They were treated terribly. You know, the prices for the events were high. Once you got inside the gate, the prices for just living conditions, like a bottle of water, for example, Mm -hmm. were just grotesquely exploitative. Like, that was the norm for music festivals for a long time. Then there was a, a kind of a movement that started in England with festivals like Meltdown and All Tomorrow's Parties where the festival stages were curated by someone. Like they would say, okay, this this band or this artist is going to select a slate of music, and that's what you're going to see at this festival. And not only that, we're going to keep the entrance prices reasonable. We're going to provide you with accommodation so mm-hmm. you don't need to, you know, sleep in a tent out in the mud, you know. <laughs> uh, and you're going to get to mingle with all of these people while you're there. So it was much more social, much more egalitarian um, the the All Tomorrow's Parties festivals, for example, are some of the, the best times I've ever had in my life. Yeah, um, but that's the one festival you'll tolerate. <laughs> well, when it when that happened, we had a sort of a blanket policy of we, my band Shellac. We just didn't play festivals because mm-hmm. they were awful, and we got convinced by some people who had played some of these new generation festivals that we should we should think of them as a different thing. And so experimentally, we played a couple of them, and they were different, and I could get behind them completely. Now, specifically, the festival, All Tomorrow's Parties, was mismanaged financially tremendously and ended up, like, sort of crashing and burning in a kind of a a tragic way. But that attitude that they fostered, which is that you treat the patrons well, you treat the bands well, you give everybody a full-spectrum experience and not just, like, open the gate at at a field and let them barrel in and <laughs> here's a know, porta potty exactly uh, that ha- is what has survived and that changed the industry of music well festivals. that's good that it's going on. my biggest issue with festivals is I don't get enough of the act I want to see I don't want to see just an hour or 90 minutes of the headliner you know I want to be there for the whole show I also don't like being outdoors but I'm you know, <laughs> I got a lot of complaints uh, <laughs> um, anyway let's let's talk about poker because obviously you discovered the game early on. Your great grandmother introduced you to. Your father played bridge at a high level. You know, uh, pinnacle games with the family. I mean, yeah. this is in your life forever. I mean, we. I'm not a big games guy. Like there are some people who just like naturally take to games and they play chess and backgammon and they, you know, they play bridge at a high level. Mm-hmm. They they play gin and poker and you know, curling, whatever, you know, like I'm not a universal, (laughs) I'm not a universally interested games player. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, I, I find the structure and mechanics of chess fascinating, but I don't have whatever mental capabilities are necessary to be expert at it. And so I find it very frustrating. Um, I feel like my particular abilities are suited more toward a game like poker 
where I have a decision tree for a number of things and they can all be evaluated independently as opposed yeah. to a game like chess where literally you have to grok the entire <laughs> game from the first move or you're dead, you yeah. know. Um, and I played poker casually through college and I was there was always a home game that we could play in. But um, I do have to credit, there was a guy that worked at Electrical Audio named Russ Arbuthnot. He was um, one of the guys that was there from the almost the very beginning of the studio. And he took an interest in poker, and he introduced me to the online poker resources, which at the time, the early 90s, were things like the RGP, rec.gambling.poker, mm-hmm. Usenet poker, group, yeah. and the 2 plus 2 forums and things like that. And, and um, I started to read more about the game, take the game more seriously. I started playing more. When Hold'em became the dominant game. There was a big boom, big rush of interest in poker when Hold'em started being televised. No Limit Hold'em tournament poker started being televised, and a lot of people started to get into poker. So, And whenever there's a big expansion in the player pool, there's a big dilution in the sort of quality of the player pool. Like you're no longer you, – you could go to the casino, and instead of having like the three regulars who knew all the moves – there would be like 40 or 50 people clamoring to get into a game and most of them didn't know their ass from a tree, Yeah, you know. Uh, so that changed my interest in poker just because it became a viable secondary income. Of course. You know? So tell me about the Tuesday game. The Tuesday game is a very social game in Chicago, very mm-hmm. low stakes. Um, it started out with 25 cent blinds. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, I think we've graduated to 25 cent, 50 cent, uh, mm-hmm. most recent games. Um, but it's a... It's a dealer's choice game. Um, there are the big bet games are twenty five cent, fifty cent blinds, and the limit games are two dollar, four dollar limit games. Okay. And basically, the slate of games is rotates uh, with the button. So when you have the button, you pick a game mm-hmm. and we'll play an orbit of that game. Then you get the button a second time. We play. <laughs> we play another hand of it with you on the button, and then the button moves to the next guy. Then he picks a game. Um, we often alternate. Oh, wow, so you get two buttons on your game? Yeah. That's fun. When you pick a game, you get two buttons. <laughs> um, so often what happens is we'll have alternating rounds of dealer's choice and no limit hold'em. And that's because there are a lot of people who, in a social, casual game, they don't know any of the other games. Yeah. And so they feel out of their depth. And But they're familiar with No Limit Hold'em, so we can play No Lim- Limit Hold'em for an orbit and let them get their feet yeah. wet. And then we hit them with a game like Swing this is, this or is your game <laughs> that you're talking about. Whammy Stud 8 or something like that. Yeah. This is the game that you host, right? Yeah. Because it started at a bakery or something? And... It started at Russ's apartment, which okay. was above the Alliance Bakery. And so oh, the, okay. the, the, the game got nicknamed the Alliance X game because it was mm-hmm. the Alliance X, meaning it was like kind of a secret society. Of course, you know, yeah. right? And <laughs> back in the Wild West of the online poker days, like on every poker uh, platform, we had a shared account like on Poker Room and uh, – <laughs> Party poker or whatever. There was a there was an Alliance X account <laughs> that we would sort of mutually fund, and then anybody who wanted to could hop in on that account and play on this it. This doesn't sound legal. Oh, yeah, I mean <laughs> that would never fly I now. Know about this? Yeah. The statute of limitations is up. Don't worry. Yeah, that would never fly now, of course. <laughs> but um, at the time, nobody even thought that was weird. Yeah, of course. Like it didn't seem weird to have a group account that anybody could play on. That just seemed though, like a totally yeah. normal thing. So, um, and that's through that. Through those circles, the uh, Tuesday game regulars and the, all the people ancillary to that, like um, that's when we started talking about poker. We had our own mm-hmm. little private forum where we would talk about hands, and yeah. And then Brandon eventually moved into that game. Uh, I was playing in the same games as Brandon on Full Tilt, and he. Uh, the first interaction that I remember having with him was I made a bad raise in a Raz hand, mm-hmm. and I ended up winning the pot. And he messaged me. See how that works? Full circle. Right? <laughs> wow, exactly. Did we start talking about resins? <laughs> he messaged me a link to uh, like a Pro Poker Tools simulation showing how far behind I was That's on fifth hilarious. when I made the bad raise. It was pretty funny. Were and you nice about it? Was it like passive No, he was being like, a real dick. Here you go. You don't seem to understand yeah. the, the math behind it. No, this. he was needling. Just popped it in there probably. I don't know. He, I, there are for no sure, words, I'm sure. I don't for really sure needling. Yeah, 100% <laughs> yeah. needling. Um, but then, anyway, then like we got to talking, and uh, he was on the two plus two stud sub forum where um, 
uh, I also, which is also where I met Eric Rodewig, who played mm-hmm. in the game yesterday, and um, CG, and a lot of the other two plus two regulars that have become sort of part of our social circle. Yeah, I mean, this game had a lot of bracelet winners in it. Uh, Brian Hastings played in this game. Yeah. Um, over the years, we've had a lot of drop-ins. Brian Hastings, he wasn't a regular. He was a drop-in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jason Gola was a drop-in. Jason Gola, Matt Grapenthien. Matt Grapenthien, he's become more of a regular. Like, the last mm-hmm. few games we've had, he's shown up. Um, Brandon's got two over there. Yeah, Eric Roderick has a championship bracelet. Matt playing that? Has he played? Matt Ashton? Ashton, no. Um, but um, who else? Uh, Martin Bradstreet. Martin Bradstreet, but he's not high a bracelet. Yeah, but high stakes. Not a bracelet like winner. High stakes. Hey, not a yeah, bracelet well. winner. <laughs> Magic Either becomes, you're in the club or you're not in the club. When you have a bracelet, it <laughs> becomes a very important distinction. <laughs> yeah, because it's one of the one of the few things that you can say that gives you any like that, one of the few like badges of recognition mm-hmm. that there are in this game. I mean, you could argue this is the toughest low stakes home game in in the world. I mean, I, I think. Uh, the Hinkle family might argue that theirs is pretty yeah. tough as well. But. And uh, I remember Cole South said that he played in a game in D.C. <laughs> that was like uh, him and all of the other high stakes heads up regulars that were <laughs> that played, and they you know they played one dollar, two dollar, exactly, or whatever, just trading, you know? just trading quarters back and forth. <laughs> uh, I remember Brandon teaching me about whammy cards. Um, and I've been trying to get my home game to incorporate them. Whammy is such a brilliant idea. They hate the idea of Whammy. All I you have to do... love the idea You have to play cards. a few rounds of it. <laughs> it's like any other brilliant thing. Just make them play it. Say yeah. it's mandatory. We're going to play Whammy Poker for the first hour. For those that don't know, this is that you put the Jokers in the deck, right? Or do you designate a specific card? One Joker. Okay, one Joker in the deck that's the Whammy. If it's in your hand, you can't win a showdown. Yeah. Uh... You lose automatically a showdown. Right. And so you either comes, have to give your hand up or bluff. If it comes up on your board, you lose immediately. No. Am I getting this if right? You, in stud, if it comes mm-hmm. up on your board, mm-hmm. you your hand is dead, you lose immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, in a flop game, if where no matter when it appears, mm-hmm. if the whammy appears on the board in a flop game, you wipe the board and redeal the board. <laughs> so if it comes in the river, you you have to do the whole thing over again, flop, turn a river. Uh, no, you just wipe the board and deal out a new board and play <laughs> oh, from there. Brutal. Yeah, the the whammy is one of the greatest inventions because, like, uh, if you like, you could have a whammy in the hole, but a very strong board, you know, <laughs> and whatever you do, you can't go to showdown, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you could also have, you know, the nuts on board. And then a whammy shows up, and the board is wiped, and suddenly you have bupkis. You have nothing. You know, <laughs> it just—it's a—it's a really great invention of Brandon's. I really like it. Well, it's sick because actually, if you—I t- I don't know if I'm at liberty to tell this story, but if you speak with <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> hello, yeah. if you speak with uh, Norman Chad again, mm-hmm. ask him about uh, ask him ask him uh, the story to tell the story about the stud version of whammy poker that uh, someone he knows played with Martin Luther King. What? <laughs> I found out about a form of whammy whammy poker stud that Martin Luther, Martin Luther King played. Heads Martin up Luther with, King. Now that's... Yes, where, where, where the black kings wipe out your board, <laughs> actually. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I'm going to have really to get crazy. Norman. Norman did agree to come on this podcast, so... Uh, it's going to happen this year, so we will have him tell that story for sure. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's your home game, but you obviously have aspirations of playing in a real tournament, right? You start well, coming out to the series. and Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in poker generally, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, one of my, it's, it's one of my serious interests. And I mentioned that my life is fairly rigidly partitioned. So when I'm playing poker, I'm not thinking about music, I'm not thinking about work or home life or anything like that. And Las Vegas is, uh, awkwardly, Las Vegas is a perfect vehicle for that because I have to fly five hours to get here. And all of my problems... I was surprised to find out that you didn't like Vegas. You were surprised yeah. that I didn't like Vegas? Well, listen, I've been to Chicago and it was miserably cold. <laughs> so in my mind, I'm like, maybe you just like getting out of the cold or something, yeah. you know? I- 
Um, well, no, the thing about Vegas is that the just the, when you're here, you're like in a completely separate universe. Like everything in Vegas operates differently than it does in, in the outside world. Yeah. And so it, it's conducive to that mindset of like, well, I'm here. I'm in this mode. I'm behaving this way. I'm doing this one thing. I'm not thinking about any of anything that's going on back home. I don't have any of that on my mind. And you can burrow into the problems at hand in a hand of poker, for example, without having anything else on your mind because you're sort of in this. In, it's like when you're wearing the scuba mask and underwater, you have mm-hmm. a different set of problems than you yeah. do when you're, you know. Nevada Steve you know. doesn't even know how to play guitar. <laughs> he, he's only concerned with, with percentages. Sure. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a re- pretty reasonable way of looking at it. Maybe seeing a show or two. But when I'm uh, – but because my time is so valuable, like if I'm um, – uh, the overhead of my life is quite heavy, like mm-hmm. uh, running the business, paying the employees, uh, paying my mortgage, taking care of my home life with my wife. And yes, you are quite famously not as rich as you should be. <laughs> 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 That's the overwhelming theme I see in every documentary. <laughs> yeah, Six, that, you don't, you wouldn't believe how much money Steve should have. <laughs> Steve always tells me that I'm a nice guy myself to broke, and he's like, he's <laughs> right? Like the fucking the definition of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, just a quick summary for those who don't know. You could take a percentage on all these albums that you help record, and you don't. <laughs> right. I mean, I I have an ethical position, which is that the musicians making the, the records, musicians making the music should mm-hmm. get the lion's share of the money. Yeah. It's their music. They've spent their whole lives making it. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, they should get the lion's share of the money. The way the music industry was structured until it collapsed – was that the admin of the music industry got the lion's share of the money and the artists got the bare minimum that they could get away with paying them. Yeah. And one vehicle for that was a thing called recoupable accounting, meaning money that was spent on the band's behalf would come out of their royalties. It wouldn't come out of the operating budget of the company, uh, the record label. It would come out of the money that would otherwise have been paid to the band. So if the band... Um, made it a, a million dollars in royalties, but making their album cost them a half a million dollars. That half a million dollars would be subtracted from their royalties. Now their royalties might only be ten, eleven percent of the of the net proceeds of the of the record. Right, the band doesn't get a hundred percent of the sales. So by the time it all filters down, like the band is getting a few percent of the revenue generated by their music. Yeah. You know, I just find I just find that an untenable thing. I just find that, you know, that offends me. It offends my sense of fairness. And um people who do what I do, people who record bands for a living, typically are paid a modest sum as a as a a daily fee or whatever plus a percentage of the re- revenue of a record and that those are called points because you're getting percentage points off of 100%, right? Mm -hmm. And um, for a big record, um, a point could be worth $100,000, $200,000, half a million, depending on how big the record is. And it wasn't unusual for big-name producers to be paid several points, three, four points on a record. Well, then how do you feel about those producers who do have a heavy hand, you know, the... The Spectres and the Brian mm-hmm. Wilsons. I mean, does Pet Sounds just bum you out because it's... No, no, no. I mean, bearing in mind, like, Brian Wilson was kind of an auteur. Mm-hmm. Uh, Phil Spector was kind of an auteur. These are producers like, who played the studio as right. an instrument. They were making music as essentially as an artist. Mm-hmm. There was a titular artist on the record, but the music was primarily theirs. And that's mm-hmm. true in a lot of pop music as well. Like, the producer for a lot of pop music, uh, like, the... The person who sings the song and whose picture is on the cover is one of the, the minor players in the whole mm-hmm. affair. And that's not what I do, though. So uh, I think that that royalty arrangement applied to my way of working yeah. and my clientele and the kind of music and the kind of bands that I work with is inappropriate, and I won't do it. And as a result, that means that a significant wedge of money that – under a conventional arrangement would have gone to me instead goes directly to the band because mm-hmm. it's a zero sum scenario. Yeah. If they have a royalty due and I don't take my three points out of there, then they get those three points. Yeah. So I just hope that that three points is going to the band and not a studio executive that should have gone to you instead. 
Well, I mean, ultimately, because it's not, it is zero sum. Ultimately, it's none of my business yeah. what they do with their own money. But you know, from a practical standpoint, if if I in- insisted on being paid that way, mm-hmm. every band that I worked with would be a little bit poorer. And yes, I would make more money, but more importantly to me, I would be participating in a system that I think is fundamentally yeah. wrong, ethically wrong, and I, I just won't do it. And for that reason, obviously, poker has been an income source of income. It's not your day job, obviously, yeah. but it is important uh, that you don't go spewing. <laughs> yeah. Every decent poker player has a very cold-blooded analysis of how well they do, and, and mm-hmm. we, we all use tools to track our our behavior, our our results and our returns and our expenses and all that yeah. sort of stuff. And for someone like Brandon Shaq Harris, for example, who makes his living exclusively as a poker player, that kind of accounting is the the is one of the biggest parts of the job. It's just keeping all the all the figures straight and making sure that you're that you know everybody that has a piece gets their piece. You get everything that's coming to you. Mm-hmm. Like your outlay on the games can't be more than you're making from the games, or you have to pick a different game. Yada yada, right? And I try to be as diligent as, about that as a professional. I'm not a professional, but I try to be as diligent yeah. about that as a professional as I. And over the last 15 years or so, I've had to keep fairly meticulous records for tax purposes and all that sort of stuff. And it works out to over the long haul, about 30 percent of my income comes from being a musician. That is record royalties and tour income from being in a band. Mm-hmm. About 30 percent of it comes from being. A recording engineer and my salary as a as an employee of electrical audio mm-hmm. uh, a small portion of the remainder comes from speaking engagements or academic stuff or writing articles or just weird oddball stuff that I get involved in mm-hmm. and then the remainder comes from poker so yeah. about twenty to thirty percent of my annual income comes from playing cards and that i mean and I have had losing years. I have had banner years, but over the long haul, it works out to about 20 or 30% of my livelihood comes from playing cards. Yeah. If I didn't make money at it, that is, if, if it was a, if it, <laughs> if, if I couldn't make, if I, if I was a losing player long term, uh, I would have quit a long time ago because as much as I enjoy the game of poker, losing money at poker is one of the most miserable experiences you can have because you're <laughs> you're literally playing a game right yeah. and games are supposed to be fun right <laughs> but then you're just you it's know. hard to have fun losing that's yeah. for sure uh let's talk about the bracelet okay because you know everyone in your club had a bracelet <laughs> <laughs> this how sick is this i'm tied for third yeah. in bracelets in our home game <laughs> <laughs> I won a bracelet in 2018. Yeah, this is the $1,500 stud event, 310 entries, and uh, you take it down. Yeah, uh, it was never a foregone conclusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I ran reasonably well, and I tried not to make really gross mistakes. At the final table, um, I didn't get involved in a lot of hands, and the hands that I got involved in worked out sort of maximally to my benefit um, until it got heads up. Tough final table. Frankie O'Dell... Chris Ferguson and Jeff Lissandro, your heads up opponent. Yeah. And he had you down, I thought. Uh Yeah, I mean in a limit heads game. Up, right? In a limit game, it's not uncommon for like at, especially at the at the late stages of a heads up. It's not uncommon for the total amount of bets in, on the table to be roughly the equivalent to what you would have bought in for in a cash game. Yeah. So like you're each playing half a stack essentially. And um, the, you know, there are some critical numbers. Like, you, if you fall below five bets in your stack, then it's quite dangerous because then you can't play a hand all the way through to the end. Um, Is that SPR? Is that stack to pot ratio? Did I get, some, <laughs> did I get no, something right? It's just the, the structure of the game. You know, if there's a if there's a completion and a call and a bet on every street, yeah, you won't have enough to bet every. Yeah, you know, it, you you want to have. Like having five bets in your stack is is kind of uh, the mm-hmm. the minimum to play normal poker for a hand, right? And a, more than that, like seven to ten bets is kind of a playable stack where you can get started on a pot and then abandon it or whatever. Um, in tournament poker, there are a lot of strange scenarios. Like when you get down to antes in a stud game, for example, in a full ring stud game, if you get down to a small number of antes, you actually have a phenomenal 
relative position with your money mm-hmm. because you're getting eight or nine or ten to one right. on your money. So, like, it's not uncommon for people, patient players, to whittle themselves down to a small number of antes and then get their antes in very good, and then suddenly they have a stack with a couple of bets in it. You know, and yeah, actually, Ben, you wrote an article in Card Player about that a few years back. Uh, about the importance of your last bet. <laughs> uh, so those of you listening can check that out. Yeah, but the way stru- stud is structured, mm-hmm. you know, where you put a tiny amount in the pot as an ante, and that mm-hmm. makes your hand live, makes it that right. You're getting very end stage consideration is unique to stud. That one ante is all of a sudden, yeah, getting eight to one on it. Exactly. Yeah. If you there, I, I had a conversation with a, an, another tournament player, and he was saying that you know, like if you could be all in for the ante on every hand, you'd be printing money. Exactly. You know, like if you could just be dealt a hand, a, a stud hand, everybody else has a full stack, and you have one ante, and that happened every single hand, you would make limitless money basically mm-hmm. because you're getting eight or nine to money, eight or nine to one, and they're on every hand, knocking each other out in the later streets. Exactly. And exactly. so you're never competing against. The full table. You're only mm-hmm. competing against a couple of players, so um, so that's one odd consideration with stud format games. But the other one is that like if you have like as long as you have five or six bets in your stack, anything more is really it's kind of decoration. <laughs> it's kind of decorative in a in a in terms an of embarrassment of riches. <laughs> <laughs> so it never really concerned me that I was down. Three to one, or you know, two to one, or whatever. Like it never really concerned me because, as long as I wasn't going to go broke in the next hand, it kind of didn't matter yeah. that much. We were going to be playing for a while. Um, the most significant thing about the heads up in that bracelet was just before going into heads up. Um, I had uh, dinner with Matt Ashton. Mm-hmm who is a fantastic poker player, general poker player. He plays mixed games almost exclusively. He plays a lot of PLO, but he's a very good mixed games player. A bracelet winner himself. He, he, won, 50K <clears throat> he won the poker 50K Players, players Championship. Championship. Yeah. And, uh, but what makes him unique is that he has done a lot of um, mathematical work on situations in stud hands that I don't think anybody else has done. Um, and he applies that sort of instinctively now. Like he's he's drilled himself into these situations. And we had a long conversation about opening and defending ranges and defending strategies heads up because I didn't have very much heads up stud experience. I had right. some, but not not very much. Um, and as it turns out, um, at Aussie Millions, um, Matt Ashton had played a few hundred hands of heads up mix game with Lissandre, Jeff Lissandro specifically <laughs> ca- in a cash game. Um, and uh, he didn't give me any per- any specific reads, but he I I shared him with him my reads of Lissandro from playing with him all day, and uh, he concurred. He confirmed that like those things that I thought he was doing is exactly is what he was doing. Mm-hmm. That, I thought that was good. Uh, that was very helpful. And then just his general heads up strategy, like the thumbnail version of his general heads up strategy, helped me a lot because uh, there were a few axiomatic moments where like. Um, I might have like a hand that, by its on its merits, is kind of garbagey, but relative to Lissandro's completion, uh, my garbagey hand probably was the favorite, and yeah. so I could try to take the pot away from him there. Uh, and if he continued, I would know that I wasn't a, a, a bad dog, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Well, uh, you obviously worked out. You took it down. Got a bracelet. You're in the club. Yeah. Uh, I, I ask everybody, where do you keep your bracelet? Uh, I keep it in the box mm-hmm. uh, downstairs in the basement where the poker table is. There's, there's a uh, we have the cash box for the Tuesday game, mm-hmm. and the bracelet is in the cash box for the Tuesday game. Oh wow, yeah. a lot of trust in your crew. <laughs> eh, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you've seen a, a bracelet recently, but you couldn't hock it for much. So it's, you know, <laughs> I mean, p- players have tried. Yeah. It's uh, it seems to be an issue every six months or so. You hear, you see another bracelet go up on eBay. Yeah, uh, we have you some. You just said that you just like you made the best uh, <laughs> analogy. You said I think the bracelet looks like like a a band of melted old apartment keys. <laughs> our, our old apartment keys with uh, with melted, melted lifesavers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, so you don't wear it for? Uh, oh hell no! Uh, out and about. There's there there. <laughs> As a piece of jewel, I'm not a jewelry guy, you know. You but do have a little earring. I have an earring that I've had since <laughs> I was 13, but that was like a 
you know, that was a very rebellious thing to do in 70s Montana. So would <laughs> wearing this bracelet yeah. be. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, know. you walk around Chicago with that. Not yeah. too many people are going to be doing that. Well, piece. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, when Brandon won his bracelet and I, I came out, to, he, the, he won his bracelet like the first two or three events in that series, the first one. First one. Um, and I, I came out to Vegas to, for my when my series, when I finished my tour, I came out to Vegas for my little stint that mm-hmm. year. And uh, he had it with him and he like opened the box and he pulled it out and I was like, Man, that looks really serious, you know. <laughs> and then a few years later, I win mine, and I pull it out of the box, and like, man, that looks like crap. <laughs> <laughs> the old ones were much nicer. Yeah, like they, I'm. They're made by the company Jostens, who mm-hmm. do like class rings for high schools and stuff, and like you know, and like you know, best salesman awards and like things like that, you know, <laughs> like employee of the month, you know. Oh man, where kind of... is my high school ring? I have no idea. They're made by that company and they're, they're sort of executed at that scale mm-hmm. of beauty, you know. <laughs> what's, like what's your birthstone? Let's get it in there as well. <laughs> uh, we have some rapid fire questions to Go. close it out. Are you ready? Hit me. Um, okay. What's up with the way you hold your guitar strap? When I was a teenager and first getting into playing music, I played bass. And the cheapest bass you could buy at the music store at the time was a a bass called the PVT-40. PV is famous for making very workmanlike, very durable, no-nonsense instruments and amplifiers. They're not like a a prestige brand. They're like like a, you know, spade and shovel, you know, like they're just, they're just working musicians tools. And Squire to the Fender? Yeah, something like it's something like that. Mm-hmm. But their reputation was that their stuff was always very ballsy and durable and you could you know, it's hard to break and and it, the joke is that a, every kid his first amplifier is a P V mm-hmm. and he still has it, you know, and it's thirty years later and unfortunately it still works, you know. Because <laughs> they're they don't sound that great. There's nothing special about them as instruments, but they're very, very durable, very reliable. Anyway, and the P V T forty was kind of in that mode. It was built like mm-hmm. a Soviet thing, like a, you know, it was you know, three inches thick and weighed about thirty pounds or whatever. So when I would wear it around my neck conventionally I would get a sore shoulder or so you know a sore neck and it sucked. So I tried to devise a way for me to wear it where I um I wouldn't have that weight around my neck. I I w- I had a motorcycle at the time and there's a concept in motorcycle mechanics called sprung weight versus unsprung weight. And unsprung weight is weight that doesn't have any suspension uh beneath it and that's it feels heaviest. So sprung weight, meaning if I could mount that guitar to me, it would be sprung by my legs and I wouldn't notice the weight as much as opposed to having it around my neck where I would feel all that weight bearing down on my neck. Yeah. So I figured out a way to wrap my guitar strap around my waist and wear the, my guitar like a belt and then it took all the weight off of my neck and it was just instantly more comfortable. And I just stuck to it as a, as a habit. I, I don't I don't I can't take credit for inventing it because it seems like such an obvious solution somebody else must have done it but I have as a as a just genetically I have extremely long arms and so it is maybe more comfortable for me to wear a guitar that way than other people because I have ape like limbs well I was watching uh Big Black's Seattle show from mm-hmm. 1987 last night I was born this town. And I noticed that, I, I, you know, it's not the greatest video quality. And at first I thought, did he somehow fasten his guitar to a fanny pack? <laughs> because I don't know, it's the 80s. Maybe that was a thing back then. But No. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, there are <laughs> other people who have made like sort of specialized harnesses for <laughs> guitars to, for the same reason, to take the weight off your neck. But mm-hmm. um, I just use a conventional guitar strap, a very long con- conventional guitar strap wrapped around my waist. That's all. What's the most bizarre thing you saw a band do in the studio or worst band drama or something like that? Um, there have been a few like bands that broke up on the spot after completing their record. Like they get, get you know the the last symbol fades out and the guy says "fuck it, I'm out." You know, and then, what? That's, and then, you're, then you, don't you want to stick around and see how it does? <laughs> um, so that's happened a few times. Uh, there have been there was a there was a, a singer who was at the studio. We we had we had dormitory rooms at the studio where the bands could stay, and. Uh, there was a singer who 
was uh, staying there with her boyfriend, and she was being sort of aggressively flirtatious with the staff, and gradually we got the idea that she was looking for somebody to join them in the in the bedroom oh. on the staff. Uh, and I had to give read everybody the riot act and <laughs> say, you know, if they want to go out to a bar and go shopping, that's none of our business. But, you know, we really can't – you really can't be getting involved in the personal lives of our clients, that sort of thing. And then she also wanted to sing in the nude. But it was the dead of winter, so we had to get we had to crowd all the space heaters around the microphone. <laughs> Does that is, doesn't affect the the audio quality at all. I mean, you could hear the heaters, yeah. But I, I it was you know, worth it. What, I'm not going to go that far, but I'm I will say that that's what she wanted. So there you go. Uh, I read in an interview that you used to prank call celebrities. Uh, not just celebrities, but like friends and but celebrities were by far the most fun. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in the studio with Nirvana, um, they had a their management company said, hey, hey, Gene Simmons is working on a Kiss tribute album and he wants you to do it. And they did not want to do it. And uh, there was a phone number where they could call Gene Simmons back to, call, to talk to him. And they're like, I don't. And, and so Kurt was like, I don't want to talk to this fucking guy. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and Chris Novoselic says, I'm not talking to him. And I said, I'll talk to him. That's awesome. <laughs> so we called Gene Simmons and, we, and I pretended to be Kurt Cobain. And I pretended that... Uh, you know, a lot of the decision making wasn't in my hands because I haven't been making good decisions. And uh -huh. recently, you know, this was after there'd been a big drug scare and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like uh, just kept him on the hook for a long time. And <laughs> uh, like he was started trying to trying to um, uh, trying to commune with the band. He started rattling off the names of bands that he thought would impress them. Oh, that wow. that would that were either going to participate in the in the tribute album, or bands that were uh, that they would be familiar with, and and one of the bands was the Melvins, who was a band from their town that they had grown up with and they were friends with, and then there was another band from the Northwest, a very influential punk band from the, from Portland called the Wipers, who I knew were a um, a particular favorite of Noana, and so I mentioned. The Wipers and said, you know, like you know, I asked Gene Simmons if he was familiar with the Wipers, and <laughs> and, he, and he said, I don't know the Wipers. I know the Melvins. I don't know the Wipers. <laughs> <laughs> for Did months, you ever let on who who it was? Or? No, but for months after that, like like Bob Weston was the assistant engineer on that session, and mm -hmm. he's in the band shellac with me. And for months after that, whenever there was a you know like whenever something absurd happened, somebody would say. <laughs> I don't know the wipers. I don't know the wipers. I know, I know the Melvins, but I don't know the wipers. <laughs> uh, you have a cooking blog. Uh, what's yeah. your go-to meal? Um, most of what I cook is like uh, you know, almost all of it's Italian inspired, just because my that's the kind of cooking I do best, and like mm -hmm. a lot of pasta and like pasta with a uh, secondo, or you know, like a, you have a big thing and then some pasta that goes with it. Yeah. And then, or and some contorni, like some stuff on the side, like some vegetables, a big thing, and some pasta. Like that's a good, that's a typical meal. And the big thing can be anything. It can be like um, a stew, or it can be a cut of beef, or a piece of chicken, or you know. Okay. Whatever. Well, do you have like a a death row meal? Um, my mom made these capoletti, which are a, they're a little um, a little dumpling, little like thumb sized dumpling. Mm -hmm. And she would make those, and uh, and you you get a bowl of broth with a bunch of these little tiny dumplings floating in capoletti and brodo, and that I lived for that. When she would agree, I mean, it's a lot of work because it takes a long time to make these little tiny, yeah, little, little tiny Each piece by hand. Yeah, <laughs> you have to cut the pasta into little squares and then put a little tiny dab of meat in there and then fold it up and then squeeze it and boil them. You know, it's a lot of work to make these things. And so when she, love. <laughs> when she would commit to doing that, I was just like over the moon. And that, yeah, yeah if like, I don't know what they're going to get me for. But when, you know, when I'm in prison and they're about to kill me, that's yeah. why I, I hope I hope, the hope it happens. Chef knows the recipe. So. Oh, prison chef. My mom is coming. <laughs> he makes me these care packages of, of bacon that he he cuts and cures himself, which is oh. it's the best bacon I've ever had. We have I have a when Your when we were renovating our house. So fucking good. When we were renovating our house, I asked the Masons if they could build a fireplace in the kitchen because I'd always fantasized about being able to cook over an open fire in my own kitchen, like, in, you know, it'd be the range and the oven and then a fireplace. I, I always thought that would be great. And they're like, 
And the guy's like, yeah, I can put a fireplace anywhere. It's like, okay. <laughs> so like, all right, right here, right next yeah, to the right kitchen here. counter, can right next to the window, can you put a fireplace right? And he's like, yeah, I can put a fireplace anywhere. So, okay, so <laughs> they put a fireplace in the wall. So now I have a fireplace with an open, like just an open fireplace in my kitchen so i can cook over wood whenever i want pizzas and stuff right uh it's not an oven it's a fire it's like oh, a grill okay. so it's like a fireplace hearth so it has a grill in it and i can grill steaks over it mm-hmm. and then above the fireplace there's a smoker box so what i do is i cure bacon using a, a, a cure that i mm-hmm. worked up using a lot of herbs from our garden and then i collect all the herb stems at the end of the season uh, and then I smoke the bacon over wood with the herb stems from the garden. So it'll be like all the oregano and rosemary and mint and chives and like everything that's at the end of the season. We cut everything out of the garden, down in the garden, and then just take all that in and, and use that to smoke the meat with. And bacon smoked over herb smoke is really, really great. That sounds good. And I've so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> and you know Brandon's on the caveman diet on the on the he's doing the keto thing so he can mm-hmm. eat bacon so. nothing but meats and cutting out all the carbs over it yeah uh okay you have a dream six max table made up of famous musicians living or dead hmm and you take up one spot wow um I don't like commingling poker and music because <laughs> there are some musicians that I know that play poker mm-hmm. and uh, the the ones that I would want to play with are not necessarily the ones that I would want to hang, hang out with if you, get my, if you get my drift. All right, you're starting a band <laughs> and you need three poker players to fill it out with you. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> yeah, it's dead easy. Brent Shaq Harris is a phenomenal musician. He mm-hmm. can play several instruments uh, at an expert level, right? For those who haven't checked it out, go listen to Brandon Shaq Harris's Poker Stories podcast episode. It's a uh, it's a delight. We had fun. We had fun. You yeah. crush it. Thank you. Uh you crush it. Then um uh well, Magic Ninja, um, Martin Bradstreet, mm-hmm. was he had his own rock band and he like toured for a couple of years. Committed full, committed completely to playing music for a couple of years um, as an experiment, I think. And um, now he's committed completely to game design and making mm-hmm. vir- um, uh, virtual VR games. Um, but he's an uh, he's a phenomenal poker player, but he's also a phenomenal musician. And I think with those two guys in the band. Like the third, we just need to find some guy that can hold drumsticks, and we're done. Yeah, uh, it'd be he would. I think I think he's just being generous because we're friends. Like I think if he had to be in a band with us, like he just want to blow his brains out because we're space guys. I just want to hear the the poker related name of the band. Uh, uh, that exist. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. There's you a call g- yourself uh, trips or a set. Uh. <laughs> Take a bath, would you? <laughs> there's a there's a guy that plays in our home game whose entire personality is wordplay and puns. Mm, his name name is Ben hilarious. Bass. He was a contestant on Jeopardy and stuff. His his entire he's a he's a, one of those guys that's an avid games player, avid trivia player, that sort of that sort of thing. He and he was, he was a regular in our home game for a, a long time. He I'm sure he would have an answer for yeah. what would be the best pun name for a rock band <laughs> composed of poker players. I'm sorry, I have no such answer for him. <laughs> Uh, best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Uh, I think that's got to be the sweet two on Brandon Shaq Harris. He had a million dollar summer, and I had a sweet two of his whole summer. High five! And equally, my best my best piece was Steve's bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All works works out. out. Works out in the yeah, end. Yeah. Um, we we have a, a mutual friend, Eric Rodewig, who is mm-hmm. um, he's a uh, depending on the order of these podcasts, maybe you've already heard it. <laughs> <laughs> um, my nickname for him is Little Pieces because he he has little pieces of everybody. Like mm-hmm. if if he knows you and if he thinks that you have value, he'll get in there. He'll try to like yeah. give me something. You know, don't shut me out. out his know? action. So um, uh, there was a. a there was a while there, very brief period, where I was his second best horse. There you go. <laughs> uh, weirdest place you've ever played poker for money. I know you try to find little spots when you're on tour. Yeah. Um, well, at those music festivals that my band plays, uh, when All Tomorrow's Parties was a going concern uh, and they were residential festivals, that is the, the, the audience would stay 
either at the at the hotel or at the the resort or at, where the festival is going to be, um, we would always have a um, just a round the clock poker game in one of the rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, that was always tremendous fun. I always enjoyed that because you'd you'd get people to drop in, and people would drop in who were music fans who were there for fun and they would be introduced to poker or, they, or they, occasionally people would be like. Oh man, I'm I'm super stoked. There's a poker game here, and you actually would run into some pretty good players, and that's mm-hmm. right. So that was really fun, really social environment for playing poker. Um, I played poker in Krakow, Poland, <laughs> at a uh, a place called Holdem Club, <laughs> <laughs> and. and and betting in Zlotys was a lot of fun <laughs> because they're called Zlotys. <laughs> Zlotys. I like that. Did yeah. you win? Uh, I don't remember. I, mm-hmm. I could look it up, but I'm not going to. At least it was uh, memorable for another reason. Yeah. Who's the the best player we've never heard of? Uh, used to be Jason Gola. I think, I think that still applies. Yeah. Still Brandon applies. and I play with Jason regularly in Chicago, and mm-hmm. he has – he is – has the gives off a very casual, loose impression because he plays a lot of hands, but his decisions are very good and he gets maximum value for his hands. He's not afraid to bet his hands for value quite thin. Um, he has a very, very good individualized read mm-hmm. on who will pay him off in certain spots. And uh, yeah, I think he's as far as like general mixed game players are concerned if he committed to it i think he could make a very good living uh, but he's a family guy and he has a straight job and he just plays regularly in in the chicago area i think he's a phenomenal player well he is a bracelet winner as well yeah so. but he was under the radar like it was for a while when the chicago crowd would come out to the world series that everybody was under the radar because nobody like there weren't a lot of tournament series that would come through chicago there were a couple of them yeah um and so People weren't as well known. People in our circles weren't as well known, and we would see, you know, a guy like Jason or like Skippy or you know these other people that we know in Chicago, or Cheech, who's another regular in Chicago. Like we would see these guys in the games, and everybody would underrate them. Like everybody would be like, I don't know this guy. He looks like a schlub, and he and he talks funny. You know? Yeah, and uh, and so th- like a lot of the under the radar Chicago players did quite well in the cash games and in the tournaments out here. And there's, I mean. There's starting to be more of a poker culture in Chicago. Like there are more tournament series in, coming through Chicago, and there's a more stable core of sort of regular and uh, professional players in Chicago. Mm-hmm. There's there's one other guy that I'm thinking of. I don't know if he wants me to blow his cover. Mm. Oh, yeah, I I consider that too. I actually think I think without a bracelet, like Cheech would probably be. Well, like, Cheech has a bracelet the, though. Oh yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but he's like when when you see him sit down, yeah. you just think like there's a guy. there's a guy from who's in our social circle from Chicago, um, uh, and, and he comes off as very gruff, very like well, kind of manic guy. He's like you know, he's like always talking about the sports bets, always talking about this, that. And, you know, like he's one of those guys that has like a lot of personality, mm-hmm. and it seems like he couldn't possibly be paying attention while he's playing cards, <laughs> just because he's always you know he's on his phone, he's looking at four TVs, you know, he's like you know, like every, it seems like in, like yeah. maximally distracted by the sports betting while he's playing cards. Uh, but again, he makes very good decisions, and he gets maximum value for his hands. You know, that's that's kind of a um, that's kind of a hallmark of the of a good cash game player is for your affect shouldn't give off that you are deadly serious about every decision because then nobody will give you loose action and nobody will misread your intent. Well, like if that's an issue in in casino games these days as well. Like you if know? if you. If you appear to be very seriously considering every decision and you make a decision, then your opponent will seriously consider your action, right? Mm-hmm. If you just – if you're on your phone and you fling the chips in as soon as the action gets to you, the presumption is that you're doing that reflexively or mechanically. And if you can maintain that affect while considering the decisions carefully, then that's how you get paid off yeah. and for your big hands and that's how you – And what's this guy's name? No, no, he's, just... he's not even – like he – he has other passions that yeah. that aren't as healthy, and uh, yeah. they, I don't think 
he's, he's kind anonymous. Of, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he's taking a break from poker for a bit, which is unfortunate because if he just stuck to poker, like I, I mean, I, I mean, he's played with all the big names. Yeah. And I, I sweated him for a freeze out. Uh, I had like a small piece of a freeze out. He played um, against Jungle uh, in L.A. Jungle was looking for for action, any game, whatever. And uh, our friend uh, got Jungle to play him in his best game, laying him a price, and uh, they, they played a freeze out into the wee hours of the morning. And then Jungle got upset and threw <laughs> soda all over all of us. <laughs> we, had to, we had to talk to the, all over, uh, all over me and my fiance and uh and we had to uh convince the floor person that <laughs> there was an accident <laughs> he was so um, upset he had to go make a music video after to calm down <laughs> jungle's the best, jungle's the best um what is a talent you don't have that you wish you did uh When you say it's, talent, you mean like too a, many talents, like a natural <laughs> gift. Is that what you're saying? Sure, or something you work toward. I mean, whatever. He, he knows, like, he does know like I, everything about everything. It's, I, it's yeah. pretty freaky. Yeah. There's no hole in your uh, no, Rolodex of the, skills. Th- the thing is that if if I'm interested in something, mm-hmm. uh, I'll pursue it and I'll burrow into it. And I'll if I if I'm bad at it, eventually I, I stop doing it. You know. Yeah. But I would say so. I, I play. Three cushion billiards and uh, some pool, and I have never been expert caliber as a player. Uh, I'm still fascinated by those games. I wish my natural ability would match my enthusiasm and my interest in billiards and pool because yeah. I, I think they're beautiful games. I love watching them. I love playing them. Um, I could never compete <laughs> at a, at a high level in those games because I'm I just my natural abilities are not there. Man, I watch those guys on ESPN. I'm always amazed. It's like 98% of the time you make that shot. How is that cr- <laughs> possible, you know? Yeah. Um, what was your largest non-poker wager? I'm not a gambler. Mm-hmm. Uh, so No prop bets? Very, I mean, at a poker table, I'll, you know, I'll to just to keep the mood light, like I'll play red or black or whatever. Yeah. But I've slept as many as I've kept, so... I, I'm not a general gambler. Most poker players are gamblers. Like they, they like gambling as a as a mental activity, like trying to evaluate situations and count odds. Like little pieces, for example. I mean, he he would bet on the sun coming up. Like you know, <laughs> like he'll like every political contest that has a line, he wants money on one side or the other of that line. Well, like, he know. was telling me on the podcast that Nate Silver cost him some money in the last election. Yeah. <laughs> so like that that's a. That's a gambling mentality. Like he just sort of sees the world through the lens of a gambler. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, investments, well, those are gambles, you know, like businesses, those are gambles, you know, like I, I, he just sees the world that way. I'm not like that at all. Like I have, I think at one point it was evaluated scientifically or medically, and I have about 3% gamble in me. <laughs> like I really, like I want to have the nuts or I want to, you know, be able to figure out where I'm at. And, in most gambling, you are prevented from being able to figure out where you're at. Like, I I can't imagine a more frustrating existence than watching a sporting contest and some idiot does something 3,000 miles away and cost me money. Like, I can't imagine anything more frustrating than that, <laughs> right? And so I just won't do it. Yeah. And I can't ima- – it's, it's exactly the same as like, oh, that ball fell in that slot and now I – and now they take my – that's ridiculous. Like, I would just never – I would never participate. You want in the control? Like that. I for, want for at better le- or worse. I want at least the illusion mm-hmm. that I, if I'm not in control, I have some influence on the outcome. Mm-hmm. I think that's the difference between me and a general gambler. Yeah. Like a general gambler tries to find a proposition that he thinks he has an edge in. I try to find those situations where I can influence the outcome. And then I'm then I'll make a proposition. Yeah. You know, like I when I played pool more regularly or played billiards more regularly, it was common to play for small stakes, like just among your peers or your friends. You would, you know, a number of points for a number of dollars, or whatever. And then sometimes, you know, you'd get spotted something, and you know, at the highest levels, like where you have you know expert players matching up against each other, it's very important 
the making the game is the most critical part of it. Like, right. do you it's surrender? A golf match, yeah. Exactly. It's exactly precisely the same. That's the most important part of the game because the execution at that level is going to be flawless. Mm-hmm. Like Shane Van Boning is not going to miss a ball, you know. Uh, so that's that's the whole game at that level at the you know down in the dirt here <laughs> where it's just me and the other rail bangers like <laughs> it's you know there's a, a lot more random chance if one of us happens to make a point so <laughs> uh do you have a celebrity doppelganger or anybody people said you look like growing up um before i got older and fatter um <laughs> people would uh call me like this one particular drunk woman called me Harry Potter a few times oh. because I had circular glasses at the time. Yes. I don't have the circular glasses anymore. Um, but I don't think... That's the only one I've heard. Yeah. I've heard Harry the, Potter? Yeah, I heard at the poker table a couple of times. It's yeah. weird for you to get a, a, a child when yeah, you're, when when I'm you're old. an adult. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and at this point, I'm exceptionally old. Like, there's <laughs> nobody as old as me. <laughs> Well, you know, we've had older. Well, actually, Norman Chad, uh, he confessed that he was older than me last night. I don't know if he's ever, like, spilled the beans about his age, but he said, I'm three years older than you. So that means he's 61. Yeah, he. it must be on Google somewhere. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell me about Gwen Stefani's wedding? <laughs> it was lavish. Really? Yeah. She, I was at uh, the wedding of Gavin Rossdale and Gwen Stefani, and they had, like— Tablecloths with their in monogram on it. They had a tennis court with their monogram painted in the middle of it. They had G here. <laughs> yeah, it was the two G's, Gwen and Gavin, like two yeah. G's hooked together. There were um, gimme bags for all the guests at the wedding uh, that included uh, an umbrella because it started raining. So everybody mm. got um, like an um, uh, um, an umbrella, and then the valet. When you get to their place or the place where the wedding was, there were there were valets that would take your cars and park them. Uh, and then when you'd leave, they would summon your cars individually from the valet and the valet mm-hmm. would bring you your car. And inside each car, there was a fresh box of Krispy Kreme donuts. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like such a bizarre but awesome yeah, Thing how good do. is that though, right? <laughs> yeah, nice surprise on the way out. So, um, we, we were when we were there. Thanks for coming to the wedding. Here's some calories. <laughs> <laughs> when we were there at the wedding, there were all these music business people everywhere, and you could see that everybody was like jockeying for position. Like, why am I at this table and not over there with mm-hmm. Jimmy Iovine? You know, it's like it was like, and there was a lot of that going on. Like, we actually had uh, we actually had some people leave our table and and go like schmooze their way into a better table. You know, it's like everybody was networking nonstop. It was slightly embarrassing to, for them, but um, but there were all these little monogrammed trinkets mm-hmm. on the table. Like there was an ashtray and matches. There was a candy box with little candies in it, and they were all everything monogrammed with, you know, the napkins with the embroidered monogram on it. Like, it's all, like, very, very, like, top-tier stuff. And my wife was just shoveling that shit into her purse. <laughs> like, yeah. you, know? you guys got Gigi all over your house? <laughs> well, and, and then, I mean, the charming thing about my wife is that she would, like, she was doing it, mm-hmm. you know, knowing that it was a trash thing to do, mm-hmm. but she was going to do it. She's not going to not do it. This right? is Heather, the film director. And, yeah, uh, Heather Winna, my lovely wife, Heather Winna. And then on the way out, she was like, she proudly showed Gavin. She opened her purse like, look at all of this shit I got. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. And, and, and he was super happy and he smiled and he hugged her and he clapped her on the back. Have like, you seen a Gwen's Vegas show? I have not. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was your comment. That was actually, I took my daughter uh, last year. It was her first concert ever. I mean, no doubt was my first album, so it made sense to me. Uh, we do have a question here that we ask everybody, believe it or not. Favorite album? I don't know if that's even allowed. Funhouse by the Stooges. Oh, okay. Yeah. You have one. Yeah. If I, I mean, Funhouse by the Stooges was a, a formative album for me. Like the, mm-hmm. the band that meant the most to me when I was a kid were the, were the Ramones, and I mm-hmm. listened to their records religiously. But the first time that I ever listened to an album and felt like I had completely understood a different worldview was Funhouse by the Stooges. Like listening to that album start to finish – you can picture a way of looking at the world that is sort of expressed by that album. And it sounds incredible. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a very simple, very stark recording, but super powerful. And like, 
I would I would say to a certain to one degree or another, most of my professional life has been about trying to make a record as good as Funhouse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you think of Brandon's taste in music? Do you guys uh, uh, we, do you guys have any overlap? Because there's a there's a Venn diagram. Okay. Yeah, there's a Venn diagram where like certain things. Because Brandon and I traded music after our podcast, and uh, there's no way anything I like was even on his radar <laughs> at all. I'm so down the plate, you know, top 40 mm. that <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were into his, uh, well, what was it, Gregorian chanting and uh, harps? <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like Harps. <laughs> Brand, Brandon likes oddball stuff in all mm-hmm. aspects of his life. There's like little things that Brandon likes where you get, like every one of our, our mutual friends can see some weird piece of shit someplace and be like, <laughs> oh, Brandon would love that. You know, like, <laughs> like you know, like, you know, like, what is that? Oh my lord, that's a crow wearing sunglasses. And, you know, 100%. Let's get that for Brandon. Totally you know? up his alley. <laughs> uh, favorite movie? I'm not super into movies. There are some movies that I like that are sort of lighthearted uh, movies. There's a, uh, I really like Caddyshack. I think it's a very mm-hmm. funny movie. I like, uh, there's a movie called Used Cars that's kind of another screwball movie that I really like. Yeah. Um, but I don't. Uh, like I don't get into movies as an art form like the way a lot of people do, like Zach from the uh, Zach Ralston from Poker Go, who's um, his uh, um, two plus two handle is Twin Cinema, and he has a blog called Twin Cinema where he writes in depth movie criticism, yeah. and he's a very perceptive thinker. He went to film school. He's very very into movies or cinema yeah you know, yeah i we, brandon and i go it's see not a movies movie, it's a film yeah brandon and i go see movies and we talk about movies yeah he goes to see films and he talks about <laughs> cinema and <laughs> <laughs> um so uh i'm not on that level at all but um and like for example recently i was watching i watched the the irishman okay and, i haven't had the three hours i needed to do that well and the, this is a will come as a recommendation. Then uh, I texted Eric. Uh, we have a there's a text thread with all of our mutual friends, and uh, I I texted on the text thread. I, I'm only two and a half hours into The Irishman, and I can already tell it's going to be a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's great. Um, all right, we have one more question. I don't know how I can adapt this to you. What was your worst job before poker? So let's say before recording and before okay. banding. As a, a teenager, yeah. um, uh, in Missoula, Montana, there was a trap and skeet club. Do you know what trap and skeet is? Shotgun um, yeah, shooting, shooting the targets. Yeah. So uh, now all of this stuff is automated. Like they just they have a machine in there that flings the tr- the targets out, right? Tr- that flings the birds out. And they, when These are the clay discs or clay, clay Clay birds, uh, clay yeah. discs. They're, they're actually made out of tar, oh. tar and mineral, like ground up minerals. So um, in the dead of summer, I used to have to sit in a concrete bunker with this me- mechanical thing that would fling the, these targets, right? Uh, and I would have to load the targets on one at a time oh my by God. hand, right? And then the shooter would shout pull and the uh, – scorekeeper would hit the button and this mechanical arm would fling the target out and, like, and they'd shoot and then, at it. <laughs> and then this motor would like grind it back around and it would clack into place and I'd put another target on it, right? Um, and you'd have to do that like for the duration of a match. Or, like, you know, everybody in the match would have 25 shots. So mm-hmm. there'd be like, if there's four people in the match, you'd have to do it a hundred times, right? Um, these are simple electromechanical systems where there's a guy with a, a buzzer that he hits with his thumb and that causes the thing to fly off, right? So if he holds the button down too long or if he accidentally hits it twice, then as this big mechanical, this metal arm is coming around for you to put a target on it, it'll instantly like fly out again and try to tear your hand off. <laughs> so you're so, like yeah. trying to drop the thing You're trying in. to put these, basically they're like little inverted ashtrays. <laughs> and so you're like putting these little ashtrays on a, a metal arm that's trying to slice your hand off uh, <laughs> while a bunch of old duffers that can barely see are shooting shotguns over your head. <laughs> and then... Sitting in a concrete, sweaty bunker. Exactly. And and there's this 
That might be the worst job we've There's had on this the show. <laughs> dust from these things is this black tar yeah. with minerals in it, and it just cakes your skin, like all your exposed skin. Mm-hmm. It's it's like you're working in a coal mine. There's this this like sticky black tar <laughs> soot all over you. I feel like that violates some child labor laws for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did that a few summers. My brother did that a few summers as well. Um, yeah. We end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. What do you get every time you go grocery shopping? Every time. I mean, besides the milk and the eggs and what needs to be in the Albini fridge? I'd say uh, I'd say we go through more garlic than anything else. Like really? garlic, you have to. If well, you once the head of garlic, Italian cooking, yeah, right? once the head of garlic is open, it can dry out and go bad. So you don't buy, you don't want to have like, you don't want to buy like forty heads of garlic, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I would say probably the number, the thing that I buy like sort of mechanically every time I walk in the door of a, of, a, of a like pro, produce section is I would I'd pick up garlic. Okay, and if I buy one of those giant gar, uh, jars of uh, minced garlic. Does that make me a monster? <laughs> you go you go to prison. <laughs> I think we've been working on the same jar for like six months. <laughs> oh, sweet Jesus. You don't you're not eating food at that point. I mean it's just garlic flavoring. Uh, you just sprinkle it on top of things. <laughs> uh. You've always had a good soda selection too. Yeah. Um, Sodaman? Yeah, I don't I don't drink alcohol. Mm-hmm. So I to keep things interesting, I have a a lot of different soft drinks in the house. Like um Chicago has a there's a a soda that's unique to Chicago called Green River um, okay. that was an outgrowth of the – after all the breweries had to shut down uh, uh, during Prohibition, like all the breweries had to do something. So some of them changed over and started making soft drinks, and Green River was the one that was made in Chicago. Uh, and they it, just kept it? It's still And it's still around. It's just, Did they it, also make fantastic. beer? Um, I mean, I don't know who's making Green River now. Oh, it's yeah, no, yeah. I'm sure it's, it's no longer owned like, by <laughs> Anheuser Busch yeah. or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Gr- Green River is a, is fantastic. There were some soda, like some like soda fountains in Chicago that would make floats uh, and phosphates and stuff using Green River rather than yeah. uh, root beer or coke. And a Green River float is is pretty hideous. It's like this weird. Uh, emerald green with like lime green foam <laughs> from the ice cream, and it's, yeah, it's pretty pretty and grotesque. He, and he's got a custom, uh, he's got a custom ice maker that shoots out the Sonic ice. What so, Sonic ice? You know the Sonic. Ice. Like if you go to Sonic, when you oh, get oh the that, circle, the little ice pellets of ice. Little That's ones. amazing. The trade term is pearl ice. Oh. So um, we have it a holds per- the soda better. I'm convinced. We have a we have a pearl ice maker in our kitchen, and are I you an it. ice chewer? Uh, I'm not, although that's a nice aspect of pearl ice is that yeah. you can chew it. Um, what I like about it is that it has a lot of surface area, so when you pour a drink over pearl ice, it cools it down instantly. It's like instantly ice cold. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you have it, garlic and ice with Steve <laughs> Albini. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Steve. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. That's it. That's the show. Thank you so much to Steve for spending a couple hours of his limited time in Vegas with me to record the podcast. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Brennan Shaq Harris, who was not only great at helping me wrangle Steve for the interview, but also chaperoned him to the recording. Again, if you haven't listened to Brennan's episode of the podcast, I recommend you go and check it out. For more Steve Albini, um, uh, go record an album with him at his Electrical Audio Studio in Chicago. Or you can go see his band Shellac on their next tour. Or maybe you'll just see him at the tables next summer at the WSOP. For more from us, be sure to follow at Card Player Media as well as at Poker underscore Stories on Twitter. If this was your first listen to Poker Stories and you like what you heard, then please subscribe for a brand new Poker Stories episode every two weeks. If you leave us a five-star rating and write up a nice review, let us know about it with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com and we'll say thank you with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Thanks for listening.